Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. In this video, I'm going to go over the structure of an Ethernet frame, Ethernet addressing, basics of Ethernet switching concepts, hexadecimal, and the least significant and universal bits. An Ethernet frame has a header at the front, encapsulated data in the middle, and a trailer at the end. And there's a few different formats for the header, but let's take a look at the most common that's in use today. So the first header is the preamble, and that's seven bytes in size. The purpose is so the receiving device can synchronize its clocking. So remember with Ethernet, it works by holding voltage at a certain level for a certain amount of time to represent a one, and then you let that go, wait a few nanoseconds, and then you hold voltage at a different level for a certain amount of time to represent a zero. So if I'm sending something to you, your receiving circuitry needs to be monitoring the wire at that precise time to know to look for a one or a zero. So the clocking has to be the same. If I'm putting bits on the wire at a certain rate, you need to be sampling those bits at the same rate. Next, we have the starter frame delimiter, and that's one byte in size, and it indicates to the receiving device that the next byte begins the destination MAC address. The destination and source MAC address are both six bytes each, and they identify the sender or the recipient of the frame. And this is what we call a MAC address, or a media access control address. It's a 48-bit hexadecimal addressing system. The first 24 bits, or the first half, are the OUI, which stands for Organizationally Unique Identifier, and the remaining 24 bits are vendor assigned, and we'll get into what this looks like in a little bit. The type field is two bytes in size, and it defines the protocol that's inside of the frame. Commonly, this will be IPv4 or IPv6. In between the header and the trailer is a data field, and this can range anywhere between 46 to 1500 bytes. As the name indicates, this is where the data is held from the higher layers. And if necessary, padding is added to meet the minimum length requirements, which is 46 bytes. Typically in this section, you're going to see an IP packet, and it's worth noting that MTU defines the maximum packet size that could be sent over an ethernet network. As the packet resides in the data portion of an ethernet frame, 1500 bytes is the largest MTU that's allowed over ethernet. And finally, we have the trailer that holds the frame check sequence. The frame check sequence allows the recipient of the frame to determine if there were any errors experienced while the frame was in transit. So the sender will apply a cyclical redundancy check algorithm to the frame before sending it, and it stores the results of that algorithm in the FCS field. The recipient then receives a frame and applies the same algorithm to the frame and compares its result against the FCS value. If the results do not match, the recipient knows that something changed with the frame while it was in transit, and then it discards the frame. And it should be noted that Ethernet doesn't try to recover the lost frame. It's the job of a higher level protocol such as TCP to resend that information. Now that we've taken a look at the structure of an Ethernet frame, let's take a look at the addressing itself and how that frame is communicated throughout a network. So an Ethernet or a MAC address is a six byte binary number to a computer, a router, or a switch, this is viewed as a one or a zero. However, for us as humans, we see it as a hexadecimal value. And we'll go into a little bit of a deep dive in a moment on hexadecimal. So the sending node puts its own address in the source field and the recipient's address in the destination field. And to prevent the same address from being assigned to multiple devices, every manufacturer is assigned a unique OUI this is assigned by the IEEE to that manufacturer, and it uses the first three bytes of the MAC address. That manufacturer uses the same OUI for all Ethernet products that they make. And then that manufacturer can assign a unique value for the last three bytes of the MAC address. So the first half is assigned by the IEEE, the last half is assigned by the manufacturer themselves. And in terms of MAC addresses, there's three basic types. The first is a unicast address, and that represents a single network interface card. This is a device such as a computer or a phone, for example. It represents a single device. The next one is a broadcast address, and this is an address where if you send a frame to this address, the switch will deliver that frame to all devices on the network, and this has a special value of all Fs. 
And lastly, there's a multicast address. And this is similar to a broadcast address, except for the fact that these frames are only forwarded to a subset of devices on the network that volunteer to receive these frames. So let's take a look at how an ethernet frame is transmitted throughout a network. So let's say we have two computers, PC1 and PC2, and they're connected together by a couple of switches, switch one and switch two. So in this case, PC1 is going to build an ethernet frame and it's going to use its own MAC address as the source and the MAC address of PC2 as the destination. And again, the PC will perform a CRC algorithm against the frame and store that result in a trailer as a frame check sequence for other nodes to validate that there was no data lost in transit. So PC1 will do that and send it over to switch one. Switch one will receive that frame, perform its own CRC check and evaluate that data or that result, I should say, against the frame check sequence. Now, again, if that doesn't match, the switch just discards the frame and a higher layer protocol like TCP needs to resend it. But let's assume for a moment that it matches and everything was OK in transit. Well, then the switch needs to decide where do I send this frame? So the switch is going to look at the destination address. Now, first thing it's going to look for is does this frame belong to me? Is, is it being sent to me? Now, if it's not, then the switch needs to decide where to forward it to. So it's going to look in its... MAC address table. And sometimes this is also called a CAM table as well. And we'll have another video of what that looks like. But let's just say for a moment that switch one, its MAC address table says, you need to send this over to switch two on this link. So that's what it does. So switch two, when it receives that frame, is going to perform the same steps. It's going to perform a CRC check, evaluate that result against the frame check sequence value, and if that matches, then it's going to do a forwarding table lookup. And then it's going to see that I need to send this over to PC2 on this link right here. Now, PC2, when it receives that frame, will do the same exact thing. It's going to do its own CRC check to validate there were no errors in transit. It's then going to look at the destination address and it's going to see that's my address. This is for me. So then it's going to de-encapsulate the data or the payload from the frame, and it's going to then pass it up to the higher level stack, which would be the IP stack at that point. And from there, it would be de-encapsulated the entire way up to the application. So let's do a little bit of a deep dive with hexadecimal. And before we get into hexadecimal itself, let's take a look at something that we already know, which is decimal. So with decimal, we have numbers that are divided up by placeholders, and those placeholders range anywhere from zero to nine. So if you have a three digit number, then you have a placeholder with three digits. And the value of those digits depends on the value of the placeholder itself. So let's say that we have three placeholders. We have a ones, we have a tens, and we have a one hundreds. And decimal is a base 10 system, meaning that every subsequent placeholder is a multiplier of 10. So if we have one times 10, that's 10, 10 times 10 is 100, so on and so forth. So if you have a value such as 555, if you take that value and you multiply it by the placeholder that it sits in, you'll get values such as 500, five times 10 is 50, and five times one is five. So this number is 555. And hexadecimal has a similar system. However, the placeholders there use base 16. So let's take a look at that. So with base 16, placeholders are still used, but the range is a little bit different. So we said before that in decimal, we have a range of zero through nine. However, with hex, the range is not just zero through nine, it is zero through F. So in addition to zero through nine, we now have the additional values of A through F, and A represents the value of 10, and then B would be 11 and so forth until you get to F, which is going to be 15. So the placeholder is still in the ones position when it comes to hex. So if we draw out what we have before, we'll still have the ones here to the left, 
But because this is a base 16, it is now a multiplier of 16. So one times 16 would be the 16's position. And then 16 times 16 would be 256. So this would be the 256 position. So each subsequent placement is a multiple of 16. And you may be asking, well, why does this matter? Well, remember when we were talking about the Ethernet frame type field, and that contains a type value that indicates the uh, packet most likely that is within the frame itself. Well, for example, the type code for IPv4 Ethernet is a hexadecimal value, and that value is 0x800. So if you ever needed to know the decimal value of this, you would just plug it into um, this outline right here. So you would plug in 800, you would have 8 times 256, which is 2048. And then obviously these are just zeros. So the decimal equivalent of the hexadecimal value here is going to be 248. Now this is also used to map human readable hexadecimal to binary numbers that a computer can understand. So for example, if we uh, clear this off right here, we have a binary value down here that maps to a hexadecimal value up here. And we haven't gone into binary yet, but we will at some point. And we have four placeholders for binary and they are multiples of two. So you have the one's position, the two's position, the four's position, and the eight's position. So if you have something that you need to communicate in binary from hexadecimal, example, like an A right here, then you can see how it's mapped to one, zero, one, zero. So if you multiply this out, you have eight plus two, which equals 10. And as we said before, we had the values of zero through nine, and then A through F, A was 10 and F was 15. So you can see how the binary values map to the hexadecimal values up there. So let's take a look at the least significant bit. This is the last bit in the first byte of every MAC address, and it has a special meaning. So if we have our first byte here, and this is the last bit right here, and this has a significant meaning in terms of if the MAC address itself belongs to a group or an individual. So in this case, it's set to a zero, and that means that this is a individual address. So what do I mean by that? An individual address means that this is a MAC address that belongs to an individual device. It's a unique address that doesn't belong to anybody else. And a common example of this would be a network interface card in your computer or your smartphone. Now, if this was set to a one, this would be a group address. And a group address just means that it's a MAC address that belongs to a group of devices. So for example, we said before that a broadcast address is all Fs. So on and so forth, right? Now, if you notice up here, an F is 1111 in binary. So the least significant bit would be a one in that scenario, meaning that it's a group address. So it's either a broadcast or multicast address. Now the universal bit sits directly to the left of the least significant bit. So that's right here. And this will tell you if the MAC address is globally unique or locally administered. So in this case, it's a zero. And if it's a zero, then that means that this is a globally unique address. So nobody else in the world should have that same MAC address that is on that device. Now, if this is a one, it means it was locally defined. And that's a situation where for one reason or another, you decided to go into your computer settings, for example, and on your network interface card, you decided to statically define your own MAC address. So there's nothing that really requires you to do this, but best practice is to assign a MAC address where this secondary value in uh, the hexadecimal mapping will 
result in a binary one in this particular digit. So in this case, it is a locally modified value. There is no guarantee that this is a globally unique address. If you have any questions about what was covered, please leave a comment below. If you enjoy these tutorials and want to support my work, please like this video and share it with others. If you have the means, you can contribute to my Patreon or leave a tip in my jar. Be sure to subscribe to stay updated on my latest content, and thank you all for watching.